I am Faith Oakland, and I am also very excited to see so many people interested in the school garden tour. This is an event hosted by the Montana Team Nutrition Program at Montana State University. Montana Team Nutrition works in close collaboration with uh, Montana Office of Public Instruction to provide training and guidance to Montana schools on nutrition education, school wellness, and school nutrition programs. Montana Office of Public Instruction School Nutrition Program also uh, is a host, as well as Montana Food Corps, and we have other partners. Um, this event is funded in part by the USDA Farm to School uh, Grant and Montana Farm Bureau Foundation's Promotion and Education Committee. So we have several presenters today. Oh, we have uh, Aubrey Roth, who is the Farm to School Coordinator for Montana. We have Jamie Taylor. She is our VISTA. We have Megan Randall from Park County, Bill Lombardi from Deer Lodge School District, Kara Dunstan from Cayuse Prairie School, and then myself. Uh, I am a member of Team, New Team Nutrition. I am a farm to school coach, but I also am presenting a, a variety, a, a different form of gardening from Fairview High School where I, where I work. So, so the overview goes through our agenda. Obviously, we're going to have some welcomes and introductions in a moment. We will do some tours, then we'll take a, a short break. We'll do a couple more tours. We'll do some questions and discussions. And then we have some interesting things to wrap it up at the end. Um, I'm just going to give a quick intro to what Farm to School is so we're all on the same page here. Um, farm to School is an umbrella term or movement to connect children to their food to improve their health, support farmers, ranchers, and food businesses, and strengthen communities through the three core elements that are shown here, procurement, education, and school gardens. Farm to School programs generally work best when each of the three core elements are represented. There are many ways to implement Farm to School, as we'll see today. Farm to School is not a program you sign up to do, but you build it to meet your school's interests and resources. So let's take a look at each of these core elements. First, procurement, which includes buying and serving local foods in school and after school meals and snacks. Schools are sourcing local foods across all five food groups from apples to beef and beyond. This includes food purchased from local farmers, ranchers, and processors, as well as food grown and raised at schools. Students at Missoula County Public School District raise livestock at the district's farm and then learn about harvesting and processing in the district's licensed facility. Then that meat is sold to the community and served in school meals. Growing and raising food with students is a great way to engage them in the process and get them excited about unfamiliar foods. School gardens and farms vary in size, type, and purpose. Gardens can be educational. They can be in-ground gardens, orchards, raised beds, greenhouses, or indoor gardens. Your garden could even be unconventional, like Gallatin Valley Farm to Schools, Bob the Greenhouse Bus, that provides mobile school garden education. Let's look at the education component. This is definitely the broadest of the core elements, the education piece spans food, nutrition, and agriculture-based education. There are so many connections with educational standards and different topics. Farm to school education can take place anywhere. Here, Gallatin Valley Farm to School provides in-classroom lessons at a Bozeman Elementary School. Getting kids engaged in cooking is another important piece of farm to school. Farm to school is growing in Montana. In 2018-19 school year, 54.8% of schools were implementing farm to school in some way, and now that has grown to 57% in the past school year. There are many benefits to farm to school programs, as you'll see throughout this showcase, and I encourage you to check out the National Farm to School Network's Benefits Fact Sheet, whose link is on the bottom of the slide for more information about the impacts of these initiatives. 
I know that's a very quick overview of what Farm to School is, but don't worry, we will provide more resources and information later in this event, and you'll really get a sense of how communities are implementing Farm to School in their way. I'm passing it back to you, Faith. Thank you, Aubrey. We are going to start with Lincoln School Farm with Megan from Park County. So thank you all for the opportunity to present. Um, this is just like my favorite stuff to talk about. Um, so I'm really excited to have this opportunity. Um, I'm Megan. I'm the current Food Corps service member and gardener educator with Farm to School of Park County. Um, I'm excited to take you on this tour. I'm going to end this little virtual tour by focusing on the Lincoln School Farm, um, but I did want to start it by taking like a quick virtual walkthrough of all of our um, school gardens just to kind of put our, our program in context. Uh, but I'll focus the end of this presentation on the Lincoln School Farm, which is our eight acre downtown growing space. Um, I'm going to give a quick overview of our organization and then we will start our tour. So you can go to the next slide, please. All right, Farm to School of Park County. Um, just to put our organization in context, we're in Park County. Uh, the population of the county is about 16,000 and about 8,000 people live in Livingston, which is the county seat. Our roots as an organization are in the Livingston Public Schools. In 2008, the Livingston Farm to School program was founded by a group of parents, educators, and community members who were interested in building a farm to school experience for their children. We reorganized in 2018 as Farm to School of Park County with an eye towards establishing a countywide presence. We have a team of four employees and 10 directors um, and at various times, some high school interns are also on our team. For the past 12 years, Farm to School of Park County has evolved into an independently funded school-based nonprofit with 501c3 status. Funding for our organization is provided primarily by a combination of grants and community donations. Through a unique service agreement with Livingston Public Schools, our programs have become embedded into the curriculum and daily school food services of Livingston Schools. As part of our interagency agreement with the school district, we agree to maintain the school gardens and raise the funds to cover the costs of the gardens. Our vision is to place healthy, local, and sustainable food on the plates and in the minds of all Park County school children and their families. In order to do that, we work in our schools to provide early exposure to good nutrition and a blueprint for healthy eating that can last a lifetime. Uh, we think of our work as fitting into four main pillars. You can see here, teach, grow, eat, and repeat. Um, for this virtual tour, I'll be mo mainly focusing on the growing and the teaching that we do, but I'll come back to the other pillars a little bit later um, in the tour. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, like I said, I'm just going to go kind of quickly through the school gardens. I could talk for 15 minutes about any one of these gardens, uh, but I'll keep it quick just to give a little overview of our program and what it looks like for Livingston Public School students. Um, so this is the Washington School Garden. It serves only the kindergarten students in Livingston. It's one of our more established gardens. Um, it's been around for a while, although it's always a work in progress. <laughs> This garden has 17 raised beds for a total of 450 square feet of raised bed growing space, as well as a big raspberry patch and a three bay composting system. This year we will be installing a few native perennial shrubs and grasses to act as a windbreak and to provide more variety of plants in the garden. All of our gardens have an automatic watering system and at this garden we have soaker hoses that we hook up in the spring to water all summer. So the maintenance of our gardens is the responsibility of Farm to School of Park County, but we very much partner with facilities at all of the schools to make that happen. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So after uh, Washington School Garden, our students are at Wine and School. So this serves first and second grade students. Uh, this garden has 10 raised beds for a total of 320 square feet of raised bed growing space. Both Washington and Wine and's gardens have established fruit trees and the apple tree at Winans is really productive and really a beautiful part of that garden. Uh, this year, you can kind of see in one of these pictures as a chain link fence, we're gonna plant some flowering shrubs um, to kind of mask the chain link fence and make it a more um, inviting and beautiful space. Um, besides that, this garden is again, really well established. It's been around for a while. And we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is super exciting because the East Side School Garden is very new, uh, very much a work in progress. So this school year was actually the first year that East Side students had a school garden. 
we're quickly moving ahead with establishing this space as a productive and educational garden. There's currently only five raised beds, um, but this summer with the help of volunteers from AmeriCorps and C, we will be installing 10 more raised beds, bringing us to a total of 15 raised beds or 480 square feet of raised bed growing space. And we're also going to be planting some fruit trees, strawberry plants and native grasses and some native edible shrubs like service berry, choke cherry and buffalo berry. So here at Eastside, uh, we're working on establishing the garden, but we're also working on a lot of really exciting curriculum development. Uh, for example, we're partnering with a local pollinator expert to develop pollinator corridors throughout the community and we'll teach about the importance of pollinator diversity in our lessons. And we will also be able to connect our lessons to OPI's Indian Education for All standards by teaching about Montana native plants and the importance they have had historically and currently for Montana native people. So like I said, Eastside School Garden very much in development, um, but it's super exciting that the third through fifth grade students finally do have a school garden at their school. And we can go to the next slide. Um, the Sleeping Giant Middle School has a small raised bed garden and an aquaponics learning lab in their greenhouse. Um, these spaces were originally managed by Farm to School and we funded their renovations, but now the aquaponics system is entirely managed by one of the um, middle school science teachers. And he also does most of the maintenance of the raised beds with some support of, from Farm to School. So we view the middle school garden and greenhouse as a huge success because it's embedded into the science curriculum and it's not managed by Farm to School. So that's what we're aiming for is that teachers kind of take over these projects and use them in their curriculum and that they really become embedded in what the kids are teaching. Uh, we also kind of view this as a really successful space because it's a great stepping stone for the middle school students who are on their way to Park High. So they're introduced to aquaponics growing here and if they're interested in that, we have a much more robust aquaponics system at the high school that they can continue to work with and learn from. So middle school is very much a stepping stone to what opportunities they have available as high school students. And we can go to the next slide. So this one is, oh, those pictures are, well, sorry about the uh, quality on a couple of those pictures. Um, but this is kind of the last um, school garden on this tour. And this is uh, the plant growth center at Park High. So this space is really important to farm to school for a couple of reasons. One reason is because this is where we start all of our seeds um, for the Lincoln School Farm and all the school gardens. So having our own nursery space gives us control over the varieties that we grow and it definitely saves us money by not having to buy seedlings um, from a nursery. And in 2020, we grew all of our own starts here as well as over 200 pounds of tomatoes and cucumbers in the summer. And this is also really important because this is where we had the site that we have to partner with high school students. Um, this year, because of COVID-19, we did a little bit less partnering with high schoolers just because their time was so limited because of some of the COVID restrictions. But for the 2021 growing season, we are already partnering with the horticulture class and bringing them into the greenhouse. That's a picture of high schoolers harvesting greens that were used um, at the salad bar in the high school. And we'll have some high school interns this summer. So very much coming back to our robust high school programming. Uh, we can move to the next slide. And that kind of, again, just sort of wraps up the brief um, school garden tour just to put us in context. And I'll spend the rest of this presentation talking specifically about the Lincoln School Farm. Um, the Lincoln School Farm is an eighth acre, highly visible downtown growing space. It's our first extension outside of school grounds. So that's pretty exciting for us. And I'm gonna talk about um, what it looks like, what we do here, and especially how the Lincoln School Farm ties into each of our four pillars of work. So again, we've got teach, grow, eat, and repeat. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about funding and sustainability of this space. Again, go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the Lincoln School Farm as a teaching site is really awesome. Uh, we partner with an organization called Links for Learning. And last summer we taught 35 lessons at the Lincoln School Farm uh, to Links students. Links for Learning is an after school and summer enrichment program. We partner with Links to provide hands-on gardening classes for the students enrolled in their program. The partnership has been a wonderful way to provide more farm to school education to Livingston Public School students. 
Um, I also really value this partnership because it's pushed me to think about the Lincoln School Farm not just as a productive space for growing vegetables, but also as a space that needs to be engaging for our students. So my kind of professional background is in production farming. And so it's been really fun, kind of challenging to get outside of that and think about how does this space not just be a space where we can grow a lot of vegetables, but also somewhere that's really beautiful, really fun, really engaging for students. And having the links kids there has really kind of helped us push in that direction to make it really educational and engaging. Uh, I can go to the next slide. So this is all about what we grow and how we grow at the Lincoln School Farm. Um, you can see on the right side is a picture of what the farm looked like during the summer of 2019. And on the left side is what it looked like last year. So it's pretty amazing transformation. Uh, it was pretty exciting to be part of that and really taking this space and making it something really amazing. During the 2020 growing season, we grew over 2000 pounds of produce at the Lincoln School Farm. So we made sure to pick crops that would do well in our climate and that also matched the harvest of the month items. Um, last year, the main crops that we grew here were carrots, beets, kale, summer squash, winter squash, and garlic. And this year, uh, with input from food services and what they want and what worked well, we're tweaking that plan a little bit. We'll grow a little bit less kale and a little bit less beets. Turns out there's a limit to uh, especially the amount of beets we can really use. And instead we'll be doing, we'll still grow those, but we'll be including some potatoes and salad greens here at the farm. Um, we also, those are the main crops that we grow, but it is like a really interesting, engaging educational space. We have edible flowers at the front and the end of every single row of vegetables. Um, the edge of the farm is planted in flowers and grapevines. So there's a lot more going on than just those crops, but those are the main crops that we're growing here. And you can go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit more about how we're growing at the farm. In addition to the 20 rows of annual vegetables, we also have a small permaculture garden that includes several fruit trees, shrubs, and perennial herbs. It was important to us to include the perennial garden because we want to teach our students about many different types of growing. So of course, not just annual vegetables, but also like those perennial fruit trees and what permaculture looks like. Um, that's been really fun to experiment with that at the farm. And we also have a small unheated greenhouse at the farm where we grow hot crops like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Uh, you can see in that picture, we had tomatoes in ground down the center of the greenhouse and then um, basil and peppers in pots along the edge. So that's our little tiny greenhouse. Uh, and we've just got a lot of exciting plans for the future of the Lincoln School Farm as we continue to maintain it as a productive growing space. We'll also be developing it into a more useful educational space. This year we'll be installing some native grasses and flowers and we're just doing that to kind of enhance the appearance and um, just kind of expand what that farm is doing, what it's, what it's offering to the community. We can go to the next slide. So you're probably wondering where the 2000 pounds of produce that we grew here at the farm went. And the answer is that almost all of it went directly to the kitchen at Park High to be used in school lunches. The food services staff used as much as they could fresh and anything that they weren't able to use fresh, we processed and froze for them to use throughout the school year. Um, that was definitely a lot of work for farm to school to do all that processing, but it was definitely worth it, especially because we were able to process the vegetables in exactly the way that the food services staff wanted it. So we have, you know, we have all this kale, how do you want us to, what kind of bag, how do we process it? So just doing it in the way that was going to make it easiest and simplest for them to use our produce was really important. Uh, we've been really happy with how it's been going. It's wonderful to see our produce in the school lunches throughout the year. Um, but of course that hasn't been without some challenges, especially at the beginning of this year because of the restrictions for COVID, they weren't doing as much scratch cooking. It was harder to get our vegetables um, in the school food but we've seen that really happen more and more this year. Um, and so there's still some frozen stuff in the, in the freezer that we're trying, hoping we can use before the end of the school year. Um, but that's been a pretty amazing thing to see our vegetables in the school food this year. Um, and I could really talk about that kind of going from the growing at the farm to eating in the school a lot, but I'll wait and maybe answer some questions if we have any, uh, we can go to the next slide. 
So the Lincoln School Farm as a site for repeating our work. Um, what does it mean when we say repeat? For us, repeating our work is everything that has to do with community engagement and communicating our work to the wider public. So that means hosting volunteer events, inviting parents of our students to see the farm and many other outreach opportunities. For example, this year we will expand our outreach by offering family gardening workshops at the farm. The highly visible nature of the farm helps it fit within our repeat pillar. We hope that anyone walking by the farm is inspired by what they see to grow their own food at home and to repeat our success in their own growing spaces. So just by having this um, at the location that it is, it's really accessible, it's a block off Main Street. Just by having it there, it's kind of inherently um, communicating our work to the community and that's really important to us. Um, and let's just move to the next slide, I think. Um, I wanted to wrap up this discussion of the Lincoln School Farm by talking about the sustainability and funding of the space. Um, obviously, this eight acre growing space requires a lot of work from Farm to School of Park County. Uh, it especially took a lot of up upfront labor and fundraising uh, when we first kind of acquired the space to really bring it into production. Um, but now that it is up and running and just functioning and beautiful, we have a goal of it becoming self-funding or nearly self-funding maybe. Um, so I wanted to just talk about how we might be able to make that happen. There's a few things that we're already doing to kind of make the Lincoln School Farm um, a kind of fund generator for Farm to School of Park County. So we currently sell the produce that we grow to the school system. We sell it at a much reduced rate. So we pretty much, any whatever they would be paying from the distributor that they might be buying produce from, we sell at that rate. So we pretty much just match whatever the Cisco price is. Um, so that's definitely a below market rate for um, you know, organic produce, but that's how we have found that it works for us to be making a little bit of money from the vegetables, but also still be making it really accessible to food services. So we're selling our produce to the school system. Uh, we also sell like a little bit of our vegetables to a couple of restaurants and also the hospital in Livingston. And when we're selling to any entity that's not the school system, we sell at a market rate. Um, but that that's really a small amount of what we grow. It's only if we have something that the school system just really can't use or we have too much of it for them. Another way that the school, the Lincoln School Farm is generating a little bit of funds for us is that Links for Learning, who we partner with to teach here, pays for our programming. So the farm is operating as a space for production and then also um, as a teaching space. And we're kind of able to cover some costs that way by working with Links for Learning. Uh, we also have negotiated a really cheap lease for this little property. Uh, we lease it from the Lincoln School building, which is the, I don't think it's in any of the pictures, but the building that's on site, we lease from them. Uh, and we pay them $1 a year. So that was really important in thinking about how sustainable this place would be in the future. We couldn't really take on the burden of fundraising to pay a lease every year. So negotiating that um, really generous and cheap lease was important in making this a sustainable project for us. And we definitely are always trying to brainstorm more ideas about how to make this um, self-funding for Farm to School of Park County. Uh, for example, we're looking into doing farm dinners here. So those would be ticketed events that would kind of operate um, as fundraising events for us. But we'd be using this space in that way um, to hopefully invite donors and, you know, with that ticketed event, um, raising funds that way. But again, we're not, there's a goal of being self-funding. We're not there yet. Um, but we are always brainstorming ideas. So I think at this time we will switch over to Deer Lodge, the FFA garden with Bill Lombardi. Good morning, everyone. And thanks for inviting me to be part of this program today. Uh, I, um, I teach agriculture education at Powell County High School. I have been here my entire career of about 35 years. And we have a bunch of different angles to food and growing food and eating food. I think one of the things, a couple of things would be interesting to note. I have all my students with me right here, uh, sitting in the classrooms who are on the big screen. And um, the other thing is we do not have any food service at our school at all, period. There is no lunch, no anything. And so in the last few years, 
we have started a breakfast program and we've started a kind of a, a food bank for, for families. We have started um, snacks and things like that, as well as our, our family and consumer science classes utilize our food. So it, it's a little bit different and, and how we've had to do it. We really don't have, uh, we don't have a cafeteria or anything like that. That was, um, that probably left our school 50 years ago. And so we've never had that. Uh, let's go ahead to the first slide. <clears throat> and our school, you know, when I talk about school farm, I use that term a little bit loosely. We literally have a farm um, that is run and managed by the students and the school. And I also have a farm at my house and we also have a farm per se here at the school. So I, I kind of mix it all together to make it all part of our education. Next slide. Uh, we do try to grow what grows well here and the plants in the Barassica family, the broccolis and cauliflowers grow very well. That seems to be somewhat of our limit. Um, we are high elevation and, and it's cold here. So it, it's tough to grow things. We, we can double crop broccoli though. So that's, that's pretty incredible, I think. Next slide. Um, potatoes are a, a big one that uh, they grow well here. There is a little seed production in this valley and it's something that, that takes minimal maintenance, I guess. They can usually outrun the weeds. And so we have grown potatoes at different locations um, and use those in our classes as well as around our school. Uh, last year, of course, for everybody was a little bit different. So we didn't end up using some of the food we produced in, in the traditional manner because the kids weren't at school. Um, but we have put those in food service, uh, whether that's our breakfast program or it's our uh, food classes, things like that, or to needy families. Next slide. Um, just some, I, I tried to just include some pictures of just some of the different gardens. A lot of times we grow things that are for fun or beauty or education. So it isn't always just food production. If, if someone wants to ask a, a question as we're going, please do. Um, that's kind of kind of how I was thinking you might. So feel free to interrupt if you want. Let's go ahead with the next slide. Um, here are some students digging potatoes and um, washing them up. And then we're, we're getting some bags ready to distribute out. So our kids get involved where they can. The challenge I think for me and this community is that the summer really ends. We will get our first frost like the first week of school. So we usually have to start the school year by, by getting in the bus. We have our own bus and just going very quickly out into the field. Uh, and the, there's distance to these. Um, our school farm is about five miles away. My farm is about three miles away. Next slide. Um, so soil building is a, a big deal and I'm learning a lot and getting uh, schooled and educated a little bit in the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, very rocky gravelly ground, uh, basically alluvial rocks. And so there's not much soil at all. Uh, but fortunately, I have a small dairy that I run. So we produce a tremendous amount of manure. And um, one year, we were taking the manure right behind the cows and dumping it on the garden. And I got a little carried away with the organic matter and caused myself some pretty big headaches. Next slide. Uh, what happened is we introduced... Uh, cabbage fly maggots, and they are especially hard on the on the brassicas, which is what we can grow very well here. And next thing we know, we pretty much wiped ourselves out of the brassica production. Um, so, so we changed it up a little bit how we're doing it. Let's go to the next slide, and we now we age it. We age this in some different piles, and to let that organic matter break down and it works a little better. Uh, I'll tell you about this year's problem though. It's not in a slide because it's just developed. Uh, with that manure, 
I had a lot of nitrogen, but not a lot of carbon. So I was going to introduce carbon to these compost piles in the form of old hay. And a gentleman offered me grass hay to just for free, just to pile on and mix in. Uh, so I did that and I, I had about 80 or 100 bales that I used. And when I literally got to about the last couple bales, I'm cutting the strings on them and mixing them into the compost. I realized that as I open a bale, it is chuck full of spotted knapweed. And this was supposed to be wild grass hay. And I thought, oh no, where there's spotted knapweed, there's somebody with a sprayer. So I quickly called the guy and I said, was this land sprayed? He says, oh yeah, we sprayed it with Tordon. And I said, oh no, this is a problem. And some of that compost you can see in the slide actually made its way into our greenhouse. And you'll see some of our bag culture and made its way in there. And this spring we can definitely see the damage um, from that Tordon. So that Tordon has, uh, you know, it's, it's several years removed actually, but it's still there. So very powerful. We will have to empty out some of these beds and uh, sprinkle that out on the land. It'll be just fine where you're trying to grow a lawn or something, but it won't, it won't be usable at all in a garden situation. So that, uh, that was this year's mistake. So we learned to age it, but um, the source of those inputs is so incredibly important. For the cows, it's pretty easy because I own the cows, I control the cows, and I know what they're eating and, and where the manure is. Um, next slide. Are there any questions as we're going? So I kind of am just hitting some, some different areas. And one area that's kind of unique is making spices. We found that the students like to grow hot peppers. Um, we had some students years ago that said, you know, they just wanted to try it. So we grew some extremely hot peppers and we grow some onions and some garlic. And I have had the great fortune to travel some different parts of the world, working in agriculture and working with children, uh, working with poverty. And so I've gained a little experience on making some traditional African spices. And so that's what we do. And we will blend those and then Usually what we do to eat the spice is we'll do baked potatoes and then the kids can put as much spice as they would like on the baked potato and try it out. Um, some of them are, are very hot. So the kids put just a little bit on. Um, you can see in that picture, those are, those might be some ghost peppers or, or some there. There's also a cantaloupe in the background I see there that we grew. Um, next slide. So here we are actually roasting the spices. So after they've been mixed and blended, um, we, we have a food dehydrator that we just dehydrate our like peppers and, and garlic and everything so that it blends up a little better so that you, you don't end up with a mush. And then we roast those to, to basically preserve those and stabilize that spice and then it'll store. Uh, and then that's pictures of the kids sampling that. That usually occurs in the fall of the year. As schedules change, which we have a new schedule this year, uh, we'll have to adjust what we do in certain times of the year. We won't have a horticulture in the fall anymore. Next slide. This is more of the students uh, sampling. This is fall of the year inside of our school greenhouse. You can see the bags of sol uh, soil in the background. We use uh, recycled feed bags from our school farm. We end up with a lot of them and it's a, a very cheap, quick, easy way to move and transport soil. And if you want it, you can reuse it again, or if you're kind of done with it, you can just throw them away at that point. Next slide. Um, so this is kind of a unique thing. Um, geraniums have long been a staple of the horticulture industry and a staple crop. We do grow uh, bedding plants as part of our, our fundraising to fund this whole thing. Uh, just looking at the, the chat on there. If there, there was a question, did we have too much phosphorus in the soil um, from our composting? That, that hasn't really been the problem yet. 
um, these other problems were so big and glaring with the tordon that got mixed in and the too much organic matter and the maggots in there that the, we, really, we really couldn't assess whether the plants were growing very well at all. Um, yeah, another question there, best practices engaging families and households in the school gardens. Um, we do have some tours, and I think maybe I have some slides of that, but we bring tours both to the greenhouse and to our school farm, and actually to my farm. I have a, a harvest party in the fall that's open to the community. Um, this geranium crop is a little bit interesting. So what we do is a, a seed geranium. I avoided growing seed geraniums most of my career till about five years ago. And the simple reason that I avoided it is that it's a long season crop. To get a good seed geranium, you probably should start it in December. And we're shut down. We shut down our greenhouse November, December, and January. And we restart in February, go through uh, sometime in November. Well, so we could never get those geraniums big enough. So we use zon zonal geraniums. Uh, so we would take cuttings, which is a good thing to teach kids. So a few years ago, we grew seed geraniums and they were great. They, they germinated well. And then, um, but the sale came and nobody would buy them. So we took a plant that we were trying to sell for a, a dollar even, and they just wouldn't sell. And we took all those plants and grew them out in the field. So we grew them outside for the summer. We dug them in the fall, harvested them, potted them, carried them through the winter. And we took that same plant we couldn't sell added a little time and value, and now they fly out the door at 10 bucks a piece. So it was, it was kind of a value added thing and it turned into a pretty huge fundraiser for us. I, I never dreamed, we never intended for that to happen. You can see some of our bag culture. We do a lot of bag culture cucumbers. A cucumber will not grow outside in our valley. It's just a little too cold, but we can grow them like crazy inside. Next slide. I think I might have missed some of those questions as they're coming up in the chat. There's just some of our geraniums. It allows us to get different colors. So we'll, we'll stick with a color for one or two years and we'll switch colors and just keep it, keep it going. Uh, we do try and turn a profit on um, most everything we do. We kind of have to. We, we fund ourselves through the school farm. Okay, let's see. So this is, uh, this is just a picture of our bedding plants and our bedding plant sale. Might be a good time to introduce what happened last year. Um, with COVID, we lost all our students like everyone else did at about March. And then so they were pretty well done for the rest of the year. We could have Zoom classes, but if there was a Zoom class, then that meant I wasn't in the greenhouse working or at the school farm working. So I had um, volunteers, and we've coined it a little bit, the, the gray-haired gardening crew. And so some of these people that are older and retired, they didn't like sitting at home anyways. And so they started coming in. I gave them keys, and they just loved it. And we ended up actually having the best sale of my entire career. I was unfortunately stuck in front of a computer screen all spring. Um, it's been way better this year. We have the students back. But um, those volunteers have really, really been engaged in our, our program. And they help, they help at all levels, too. They help at, at all the different farms that we have. Um, next slide. Uh, we do have fruit trees. Um, at our school farm, we have apples that we planted many years ago. Um, it is real hit and miss if the, the frosts and the blossoms are timed just right in the spring we will get an apple crop. If it don't work out, then we won't get an apple crop. And then in the fall of the year, we have a little bit of trouble with the migrating birds, blackbirds, starlings come in. And once they've found those trees in our valley, they'll wipe out the entire crop in about one day. So if we see those migrating birds come through, then we will run out there and, and, um, grab all the apples. We'll just take all our students and harvest them all. It all. There's a, there's a question there on, uh, on peaches. So 
uh, we can't even come close to growing a peach in our valley outside. So we grow all our peaches indoors and what variety we have, uh, we have whatever Costco was selling that year that we planted them. <laughs> so I don't, I don't have a clue what they are. Um, I think we'll have a picture of those. This particular picture of the apples was a real good year. The birds never came and the frost stayed away in the fall. So the apples got very ripe um, and very, very good eating apples. Uh, next picture. Yeah, and so some of our students harvesting them. A big area that we do with the apples is we make cider and we, we experimented this year with uh, herb flavored ciders. So we would have a peppermint cider and, and uh, a sage cider. And we just added the herbs right into our shredder, our grinder, and then produce that um, cider that would have some flavor to it. And for the most part, we just drink that in class. We'll, we'll freeze it. Sometimes we drink it this time of year. Next picture. Yeah, so here's the peach trees. There are nectarine trees too. And so they, they will usually flower and bloom in February and we'll pollinate them. Uh, we just have the opportunity to start talking about fruit and trees indoors when winter is still in full progress. This year we tried grafting our trees. Uh, the challenge is when we bring them out of dormancy, we go from, you know, February, we might go from 10 degrees or zero or even below zero to 70 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in a matter of just a few days. So those trees go immediately into full bloom. And so our grafts, um, this year, our grafts, we were just a little slow on making the grafts and the, the buds and leaves that already set. So they, our grafts didn't take this year. We just have them in barrels. You can see those barrels. Um, and we tried the little pockets on the side to grow flowers and they're real beautiful. It's a little harder than it looks. And what we found is the trees really like to be moved outside. So at the end of the school year, we just get a hand dolly. We move all the trees outside and they grow outside in the summer right at school and then in the fall we bring the trees back in. Next picture. Um, so not everything we do is plant related. Uh, we do have a, a very large school farm with as many as 200 animals on it. Um, so a couple things that we are using specifically in our classes and our school to, to farm program or breakfast program is our pork and uh, times our eggs if we have enough eggs. Um, the pork is when we use it in our school system to stay in compliance with regulations, we do not cut that meat. That is sent from our farm to a licensed processor. We have not yet used the, the Missoula school. Um, we will probably send some livestock to the Missoula program uh, sometime this spring. Um, so that could be something we do in the future. And then we also teach meat cutting here. And so that picture is some of the meat cutting that I teach the students. We cure our own hams, our own bacons and everything like that. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that if, if you're using a meat product, it's got to go through a, a federally inspected program. Um, next slide cucumbers and um, some plants who are just growing for fun. But cucumbers have been kind of a big crop and we sell those and we eat them in class. So we do a little bit of everything with those. Next slide. Um, we do get into herbs and we're trying to get more and more into herbs. That's an example of a little herb box that we built. And so we'll sell those and we use them in our cooking also. Next slide. And uh, our, next, our next goal is to increase our awareness of pollinators. Uh, I've never tried it. I've actually never seen it done, but I wanna bring the bees inside into or near our greenhouse with some plexiglass type windows and screens to where the students can literally walk right up to the bees and see them. Uh, in the summer, we would probably just turn the bees loose in the greenhouse and the outside. So that's our next venture. Next slide. And just some, just some random pictures of different food that we produce. I always try to grow something new. Um, 
there's artichokes up in the upper left-hand corner. New this year is loofah that we're growing. Next slide. And I think that's it. That's at this time we're going to turn it over to Kara from Cayuse Prairie. Um, Kara, are you ready? I'm ready. Hi everyone. I'm Kara Dunstan. I'm the horticulture director here at Cayuse Prairie School in Kalispell. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about our program. So I shared, I wrote up this story and I wanted to share it with everyone because I think it's important. Um, Debbie Kaufman is a local from this area and she was my predecessor. And about 10 years ago, she was just talking about her passion with one of our substitutes about how she thought it would be so beneficial for us to have a greenhouse here and for the kids to be able to learn more about gardening and be able to work with soil and that sort of thing. And he got excited and they both just started diving in and found sponsors in our community and other people that wanted to get involved. Torrent Tech was a huge help and donated a large sum to get things started. And then from there, Debbie, with the help of our SPED teacher at the time, wrote requests for grants and continued to fundraise. And that same substitute was also handy in construction and had a lot of contacts in the construction world. So he took on the task of getting time and labor donated. Um, concrete was donated by Tony Young Bird. Heating time and labor donated from the Dickey family. So there's just a lot of community involvement to get us started. And then he did most of the construction on our greenhouse as well as the shed that he installed next to the greenhouse to store stuff. Um, I wanted to share that because I'm coming from a much smaller program than most of the other presenters are. Just one school, um, we're early kindergarten through eighth grade. And it really just took the time and passion of a couple people really coming together to say, hey, this will be important for our school and community. And they made it happen. So I think some of you joining us that are coming from smaller schools that are interested in starting your own program, um, our story might be interesting to you. So um, you can go to the next slide. So our program consists of an outdoor garden area. We have eight raised beds and an in-ground garden area as well. And they just kind of made that happen out of what used to be an old parking area. There's actually a gravel pile in one corner at a time. And um, over time, we brought in crest and topsoil and kind of made it work and fenced it in. We also have indoor hydroponics, which we use in the winter months. And our greenhouse um, is a huge bonus in implementing our program, as well as how we do most of our fundraising. We implement the Montana State University's Harvest of the Month program through both our garden and greenhouse. And a large portion of the work in our greenhouse and garden are completed by our middle school fifth through eighth grade horticulture class, including preparing all the taste tests, doing all the cooking. They distribute the taste tests. Um, we used to do it at lunch with COVID. It's been a little bit trickier on how to get it to all the students, but we're able to get taste tests out to all 267 kids every month, which is pretty fun for all of them. Um, another bonus program we have is our garden detectives that I teach, and that program consists of small groups that rotate per grade, early kindergarten through fourth, and I'm able to do small lessons, um, half an hour long about gardening, importance of good soil, conservation, and other related topics. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of our fundraisers because our program, aside from the utilities the school covers, is 100% self-funded. And we have several different fundraisers that we do throughout the year. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, salsa canning is something I just started two years ago. We're in our second year with it. Um, we do it in the fall. And our horticulture class, we go out, we harvest 
all the peppers, tomatoes, onions from the garden. We bring it in, they process it all, chop everything. Um, and then they learn how to can it, which is a huge part of gardening is how to preserve your produce. So I think that's been an interesting thing to bring to the students. And we made um, $407 off of our salsa this year. I think we made canned about 65 cans, which has been pretty cool. Last year we did 276, so huge um, uh, adjustment this year because we were able to can a lot more. And it's amazing how excited the kids and the community get. I mean, it just flies off the shelves and people are coming in for more. And I, I only have six jars left that I'm saving for our spring plant sale, but it's a really fun way to get the kids involved in the full circle of harvest and um, saving it and selling it. So next slide. Um, another big fundraiser we do in the spring in our greenhouse is the Mother's Day baskets. So um, we do do some geraniums from seed, and then we also order plugs and geraniums from High Country Growers and Helena. Um, and that's mostly what we use for this. Uh, we usually make about $1,000 from our hanging baskets every year. Um, last year we did 1,100. Um, usually try and get 65 Mother's Day baskets done. And we sell them for 25 bucks a piece. And it's a really popular tradition here. Everybody looks forward to ordering their Mother's Day baskets. So, um, and the horticulture class is responsible for planting all of those. So go to the next slide. Our spring plant sale is our main fundraiser. We do get some plugs in from high country growers for this, but mostly we um, start from seed, do a large variety, a lot of tomatoes, um, geraniums, other flowers, bedding plants, and then several uh, like summer squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, a pretty large variety of just general good garden plants that people around here are interested in. So, And we usually make about three thousand um, dollars a year from our plant sale and I kind of averaged it out um, it's like one of my many jobs hats of a school small school um, I averaged out after costs we generally make about three thousand five hundred dollars a year after we buy pots and soil seeds plugs all that sort of thing um, so if you go to the next slide so I just wanted to focus a little bit on how we implement um, the program into what the kids are learning. So if we go to the next slide, our programs. This just picture the outside of our greenhouse and some pictures of some of our students starting seeds in the greenhouse. And it is mostly managed by that fifth to eighth grade horticulture class. They do a tremendous amount of work out there for us. And next slide. We also have our hydroponics. Um, do cucumbers and tomatoes in there mostly, and it's just kind of parked in the school hallway. So all the kids get to kind of watch them grow, which is really fun. There's a picture there of a couple of our preschoolers or early kindergartners sampling some tomatoes. Um, and the kids just get excited. It's a great way to have something growing in the school during the winter months. I tried eggplant this year, but didn't go very well. <laughs> uh, next slide. These are just some pictures from our school garden. So every student, uh, Little Mustang through eighth grade has curriculum that matches like fifth grade has seeds, um, for instance, and they will harvest, say, like sunflower seeds. And this year they use them in diorama projects. So um, each grade has something that they focus on. Fourth grade is carrots. So they'll come out and harvest the carrots. And I kind of coordinate how that all happens. Um, and then they find a way to use it. 
um, whether they're just going to sample it in class or if they come up with a class project to use it. I kind of support each homeroom teacher and how they're going to implement their uh, crop into their curriculum. And that's just some pictures of the kids out there enjoying the garden. Um, next crop, uh, slide, sorry. Um, a big thing we do every year is put the garden to bed day. It's a huge hit around here. Everybody gets to wear their pajamas to school. We make apple cider outside. Um, last year, everybody got to hang out and drink apple cider together. This year, it had to look a little different um, where we just took it to each individual classroom. But those are just some pictures of um, our harvest and pulling out some plants and making cider and um, it's just a really fun day for the students where everybody gets to come out to the garden that day and get involved. Um, and all of our um, our students get to be involved in planting the garden as well in the spring. So next slide. And last, uh, I do do the garden detectives. This is a picture of like, they came out and did soil paintings with me. We learned all about uh, the importance of good soil out here in Creston. We really love our soil. And we talked all about how important it is to conserve that. Um, learned about winter birds and scavenger hunts in the garden. And it's just a really great way for some of the younger students to be able to come out and get involved and get excited for when they're old enough to take the horticulture class. So um, that's about all I have. Thanks guys. Uh, as you know, I am, I work for team nutrition as a farm to school coach, but I am also an English teacher for Fairview High School, which puts me in a little different category than everybody else that you've heard from today. This. The, I, I don't do this for a full-time job, but I'm super passionate about um, teaching kids where their food comes from and uh, like trying to get that next generation inspired and excited to uh, grow their own food. All right, so next slide. So uh, when COVID shut us down, we, in person or in person learning last year, we weren't able to plant our school garden. We were not allowed on school grounds. And it was just, I mean, so everything came to a screeching halt. And what was sad about that is that our program was so new. So we didn't have a super established program when our program got shut down. And then we returned to face to face learning in August. Um, but we we were struggling with the idea of having to leave at any moment. Uh, we weren't sure how long we were going to be face to face. So we did not <clears throat> get that momentum to keep our farm to school students, um, to get our farm to school students to start any new planting projects. So in order to mitigate the lack of gardening happening in our school, I decided to explore indoor gardens. Um, after researching, I landed on the idea of a tower garden by Juice Plus because it, it is self-watering and it has a light system. This was an important aspect considering the possibility of our in-person classes being canceled at any moment. So this hydroponic system grows lettuce really well, but I wanted to try something different. Uh, why not? So I planted green beans peas and tomatoes. And the seeds are placed in the rock wool, which you can see in the pictures, then covered with, ver I never say this word correctly, vermis vermiculite, um, and kept in a growing tray filled with a quarter inch of water and placed in direct sunlight. Within a few days, the sprouts appear and soon after the seedlings are able to be transplanted into the tower garden. If you want to go ahead to the next slide. So the base of the tower garden holds 20 gallons of water and the kit comes with liquid nutrients and pH balancers. The nutrients are pumped to the top of the tower then drip over the roots of the plants returning to the base to be used again. 
I purchased the extension kit, which allows me to plant 28 different plants in four square feet. I also purchased the optional tomato cage and growing light kit. Um, we have long, dark winters, as most of you are aware. And a side benefit of the tower is the artificial sunlight from the grow lights. But um, that's a lesson for another day. This tower is actually in my classroom. So if we go to the next slide, uh, while this is my tower and I treasure it, it is important to get students involved. So pictured here is senior Paul Hardy. Paul is checking the pH of the water and making any necessary adjustments. Uh, Paul is the son of Jim and Mary Hardy, a local farming family. So Paul was not a fan of this type of growing system because in his opinion, it is not natural. But Paul has worked on the tower garden since January, adjusting the flow rate and amount of artificial sunlight, all to help the plants grow to their full potential, which I truly appreciate from him. Uh, I think he likes it more than he lets on, to be truthful. This is a learning process for all of us, but with practice, we are getting better results. I, my plants were lacking nitrogen, and because Paul is, is a farmer, he immediately noticed that and emptied out our water tank and refilled it and adjusted all of the, the nutrients necessary and the plants bounced back, which I, I appreciated. He has been so instrumental in maintaining the health of our tower because of his knowledge. You wanna to go to the next slide? So within a few weeks, the plants began to flower. Next slide. And then the produce began to appear. I was very excited to see these green beans on, on the tower. So if you can go to the next slide. In this picture, we have the green beans matured first and the students were interested in trying them at least once. It may have taken a little convincing on on my part, the, the youngster, the young man standing in the middle is my oldest grandchild. And I think he he was a, a big part in getting the rest of the kids to try it. So to get anywhere in the building, you have to pass my classroom. And so um, every day I'm asked about my plants. So it's sparked conversations about growing our own food, students, parents, and Teachers are all very interested in the tower garden. Um, several adults have mentioned wanting to purchase one for their own use at home. Uh, I've had teachers ask about how do they get a tower. So hopefully we get, uh, we increase that uh, indoor ability to grow um, food in our, in our classrooms. Uh, this these are the roots and I, I just threw this picture in because it just tickled me to be able to see the actual roots of the plants. So since I get a lot of questions about how the system works, I, I explain what I know, which is not as much as the other people that have presented to you, but I get to show the root system to anybody that's interested. Anybody that comes into my classroom, that's the first thing we, we talk about is my grow tower. Next. Students do not need permission to pick the vegetables. In fact, I encourage visitors to stop in and explore what is available. Right now we have green beans and peas. Uh, soon we should have some cherry tomatoes. Um, I have a very open classroom policy. So you'll see people coming in and out and they'll just pick a pea plant or whatever and, and move on. I know the tower grows amazing lettuce and we are learning about other vegetables and their nutritional needs. Um, in order to, to continue learning the full extent of the tower garden central, I want to grow strawberries next year. After that, um, I want to purchase multiple towers and place them throughout the school. However, all of this costs money, so we made a plan. Next slide. After participating in the 2018 Farm to School Summit, the FCS teacher, Angie Hopes, the science teacher, Angela Pierce, and the ag teacher, Jim Hardy, and I created a school plan. Part of the plan included raised bed gardens, in-ground gardens, and a fruit tree orchard. 
all of this costs money and the projects would not be school funded. There was just no money for that. In order to afford our dreams, Jim Hardy used his own money and equipment to plant an acre of sweet corn. That is a lot of sweet corn. Angie Hopes and Jim Hardy had their students pick and process the corn for sale. And I contacted every grocery store and school within a 30 mile radius. We sold our corn for $5 a baker's dozen and it went quickly. We also shucked corn and sold frozen quart bags for $3. The farm to school students took turns selling ears of corn out of a pickup bed at the local park as well. We made enough money to uh, fund our program through the end of this year. Uh, we purchased seed equipment, fresh raised bed so, uh, soil, four fruit trees, and a heavy duty compost tumbler. Next slide. So you can see some of our kids. This is a couple of years ago. We weren't able to do this last year. Um, we will continue to sell corn. However, we are adding a pumpkin patch to our sales plan this year with the hopes of having a full blown fall harvest festival. The proceeds from our project will purchase more tower gardens to be used throughout the entire K 12 building. Eventually, we want to build a winter greenhouse that can be utilized most of the school year. As our garden plans grow, so does the interest level. Our dream is to encourage students to plant their own gardens, and learn to process the produce. Bringing gardens into schools is helping students learn to grow what they eat and eat what you grow. Right, yeah, I'll talk about a few of the resources that are available to you guys and then some of the upcoming events. So there's an extensive list of school garden resources under the resources tab on our website. If you're struggling to get started or need lessons to teach in the garden, this is a great place to start. We also have some newly updated composting resources if that's something you're interested in starting. Composting can be a great way to turn food waste into a healthy garden additive as well as an excellent educational tool. On the School Garden Resources page, find tips on how to get started and fun activities to do with your students at the compost bins. Like Aubrey mentioned, we have this Garden to Cafeteria Toolkit, which is found on the resources page as well. Um, and it helps school, dis school district food services bring their school garden produce to the cafeteria while following those safety protocols. The Montana Harvest of the Month is a program that brings together the farm to school core elements in an easy to use framework. The goals of the Harvest of the Month are to support healthy Montana children and adults and to support Montana farmers, ranchers, processors, and food businesses. It's open to K through 12 schools and after school programs, early care and education, healthcare, grocery stores, and food pantries. It's free to register and you can do so at any time. Participating sites get access to posters, handouts, guides, and many other resources. One great Harvest of the Month resources are these farm to plate videos created for each food. Unlike other Harvest of the Month um, resources, these are publicly available on our Harvest of the Month YouTube playlist. And they're great for in-classroom lessons, remote learning, and promoting Harvest of the Month and local foods to families and communities. The Montana Farm to School Leadership Team works through partnerships across the state to build farm to school initiatives that help kids eat healthy, connect kids with agriculture and nutrition through education, support Montana farmers and food producers, foster economic vitality and strengthen communities. This team is formed of agencies and organizations with statewide focus and influence that are key to the success of farm to school in Montana. And you're welcome to participate in one of the five working groups, just contact Aubrey. All right, a few upcoming events. We have one other Montana Farm to School Showcase, which is grant writing for Farm to School on April 23rd at the same time. So that's next Friday. Um, we also have several webinars and showca showcases archived on the website. So be sure to check those out. Um, we hope you can join us for the next statewide Montana Farm to School Summit, which will be held on August 11th through 12th in Helena. 
Registration and scholarship applications are now open. Anyone in need of travel or lodging assistance is encouraged to apply for a scholarship by May 6th and the $65 early bird tickets end on May 31st. You can receive refunds on registration, so be sure to apply early. October is National Farm to School Month and it's a perfect time to celebrate or launch your Farm to School program. To celebrate National Farm to School Month, join us for Montana Crunch Time, which is on October 21st. Crunch into a locally or regionally grown apple and register your crunch on October 31st to help Montana win the Mountain Plains Regional Crunch Off. We also have two Farm to School coaches if you're looking for extra help getting your Farm to School initiative started. One being Faith Oakland, who you've just heard from, as she's an expert in school gardens, education, and administration. And Ginger Buchanan is our second coach whose areas of expertise include food service and gardens. If you're interested in the coaches, you can let Aubrey or I know or contact them directly. And finally, we would love to hear your farm to school success, success stories. You can share photos, lessons, stories, and recipes using the share your story form on the Montana Farm to School and Montana Harvest of the Month websites, or you can email me at any time. We would love to feature your story in an upcoming training or on our website. And be sure to use the hashtags Montana Harvest of the Month or Montana Farm to School on your social media posts. So I'm now gonna pass it on to Whitney Pratt from Farm, Farm Hands Norse, the Flathead. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Whitney Pratt. I'm the education coordinator with Farm Hands Nourish the Flathead. We're up here in Whitefish and we're really interested in creating a school garden seed saving collective. And a little bit of the background on that is we host an annual event called Free the Seeds, um, which is a totally free event where we give out thousands of seed packets that are mostly from seeds saved in our region, but come from some other seed producers as well. And then we host typically close to 25 workshops also during that event. This year we couldn't do that. We had a virtual conference. And if anyone's interested, those workshops are online. You can find them on our YouTube channel or from our website. But we are really interested in school gardens as a way to save seed in the state. And so we wanna form a collective of people who are like, my garden can save one seed. So for instance, in Columbia Falls, we want to save sweet pepper and tomato seed. And then let's say six other gardens want to participate. Each of those gardens would save one kind of seed. And then we would share packets across that collective. And so in order to get people excited about this, we have a lot of bundles of seeds that we're really happy to send to any school garden in the state. So Aubrey just put the link in the chat. And so please feel free to fill out that Google form and then I will ship you a bundle of seeds. They're all open pollinated seeds, good for saving. It's usually herbs, flowers, greens, some beans and some squash is typically what's in those bundles. And with the information from that Google survey, we're hoping to get a group of gardens together so we can save our own seeds. How did you get the board and communities on board um, with your school garden efforts? So any, any of the presenters can chime in. I know in Fairview, our, our community is a farming community. So they were extremely supportive of our school garden efforts, even though we're very much in the beginning stages of that. And I, I feel like the school board, most of our school board members are also farmers. So they, they were not opposed to a school garden, especially when we told them we were not going to ask them for any money. <laughs> I'll just jump in that um, getting the board on board uh, was kind of done before my time. So I don't really have too much to speak on there, but in terms of just getting community involvement, we have just like been communicating what we're doing relentlessly. Just like anything we do, we figure out how to tell our community that we did it from like big things to small things. Um, just telling people that we're doing stuff puts us on their radar and it's harder for them to not support what we're doing. If, if they know that 
that we are doing something and making progress. I have just one thing to add again, the board got involved before I started with my position, but from what I've seen, keeping the community involved comes a lot from keeping the kids involved and excited. So if I take all of the students seed and each grade has started their own plot of tomato seeds, they go home and say, mom, we've got to go to the plant sale and look at the tomato plants. And it just kind of dominoes. If you get the kids excited, they get their families excited and it just kind of falls into place from what I've done and seen.